Good evening, comrades. Thank you for joining us on this hot and sweaty evening. Tonight in our Communist Culture Club, we're looking at two issues. First of all, football and then Shakespeare. Not quite related, but I'm sure both will be really interesting sessions. Now, if you're like me, and perhaps you are, um, football, I try to stay away from, from the nationalism. I really I cannot stand it. Um, and also, it's got a bit of uh, sexism going on. Apparently, it only is coming home if the men win something. So the women's victory two years ago doesn't really count, which I thought was a bit bit off. So we're looking at the issue from a, a different perspective tonight. And we've got with us um, Carl, who's got a, a political point of view and sees football as an arena of the class struggle. And I thought that's a really good uh, counter viewpoint on the sort of football we've been seeing the last few uh, weeks. Thanks, Tina. Um, firstly, I'd like to say I'm aware of some of the quality of some of the academics and authors and, and Marxists that have appeared on this forum. So my imposter syndrome is looming large as, as, a, as a roofer from a council estate. But um, I'm also aware of a, of a talk that take, take, took place recently um, in regards to capitalism and sport. So I'll try not to be too um, repetitive, um, but obviously there will be a bit of crossover um, in, in the subjects that we're talking to. But um, I do come at the question from uh, a slightly different um, angle in that my, my main proposition is that football has developed alongside capitalism. Um, and as the different periods of, of capitalist development um, have, have been reflected uh, in the game of football itself, the clashes and, and antagonisms that have taken place from the earliest stages of football right up until today, in many respects, um, can be understood as having a class nature. And in addition to that, a, a culture has developed around football um, between fans and uh, a wider society. Um, and th those antagonisms and, and clashes uh, manifest themselves through that culture and vice versa, um, issues that society are facing can be expressed uh, by fans uh, in stadiums or, or in wider movements. And unfortunately, I, you know, I, I think we'll we'll see that um, the right wing have been able to to colonise that um, that culture uh, better than the left have. Um, uh, they've been successful in uh, engineering a space within that culture um, to you know, uh, harness their ideas and uh, disseminate their ideas um, into uh, football fan culture. So the, the talk will, will be loosely in, in three sections, a, a brief history of the game and some of them early clashes that developed um, between players, supporters and the authorities, um, how the right wing have, have already understood that culture and the usefulness of in, in engaging with it. And finish with a few ideas about how we can, uh, on the left, uh, get our asses in gear and, and uh, maybe start to challenge the right on that front. Um, and, and at the end, I hope you know we can share a few ideas on, on you know, firstly whether whether that's that's a viable alternative, whether it's worthwhile doing, and then uh, how we do that. So the definitive origins of the game um, are, are disputed. Um, the Aztecs and, and third century China all have um, games involving a ball of some sort. Uh, the Aboriginal Australians before the white settlers arrived had a game that involved um, a, a ball of some sort, of some sort. But the game, perhaps not entirely recognisable, but that most closely linked to what we see as football today, probably has its origins in around about the 12th century. And this game, which was called folk, folk ball, would have been um, a team game usually played between um, mm -hmm. neighbouring towns and, and villages with the purpose of transporting a pig's bladder to a marker in the opposing team's town or village. And it would have been increasingly violent and um, incredibly violent. Um, you know, there's, there's records of punching, scratching, kicking, um, clubbing, even stabbings with swords uh, that took place during these um, games so completely different to, to the game we we recognize today in that regard depending on which team you support um there were no clearly defined regulations no referee 
uh, no limit to the amount of people that could have taken part, no um, limit on the area. Um, some matches went across several miles, uh, lasting hours, uh, even days. So if we, if we place ourselves in that period in time, um, the anticipation that was leading up to some of them games, you know, the excitement, um, fear, trepidation, nervousness, you know, we, we can only assume there that a feeling of uh, comradeship would have developed, you know, a, an us and them mentality. Um, and that would have developed within the towns um, that were competing in these games. But then also over time, um, a, a sort of inter-community respect would have developed between um, people that played the game. And attempts to, to ban the game um, at this time would have only intensified that feeling um, of, of us and them. Um, when you look into the structure of the time, at the feudal structure and then early capitalist structure, um, these antagonisms and clashes would have taken a class nature. Those looking to ban the game would have included the landowners whose land was being used and, and in their view trespassed upon. Um, there's a, a recorded incident of a man once drowning um, because they'd set up a game um, with the sole intention of uh, wrecking the dikes that were being used to drain the fens here in the east of England. And others that made up um, what would have constituted authority in those days would have been drawn from the gentry and, and the ruling classes. And they would have been aware uh, of the potential danger in letting the masses come together um, in this way and letting them feelings of solidarity and, and, and us versus them develop. Capitalism, even in its earliest days, has always uh, taken a strong interest in, in what workers do outside of work. Um, not only because, you know, we make up the, the greatest part of uh, the market in which they want to sell um, their goods, but uh, also because, they you know, they want to cut any movements in the bud that would have the potential to become a revolutionary force and uh, challenge the system. But banning it, as we know, is because it was largely unsuccessful. There are periods where the game was stopped, but uh, they were unable to, to, to ban it for good. So it started to develop, um, mirror, mirroring the development of capitalism. The game was exported around the world. Um, as we discussed earlier, there were games similar that um, that already existed, but the, the new codified version would have been imposed as part of colonial projects um, around the world. Um, neoliberalism would have been reflected in the game through the introduction of markets and privatisation of clubs and leagues, uh, private ownership of grounds and facilities, and then the big business ownership of clubs, which led to them being used as, as assets, possibly to be stripped. Uh, to make incredible amounts of money from as it, as it started to develop into an industry. Uh, some owners took over clubs as a, a means of prestige um, for, for owners of questionable repute, should we say, and more recently, um, even by states, um, as a means of sports washing uh, their image as dictators or human rights abuses in their, in their own areas and their own regions and, and countries. So even in the earliest days, a counter movement by um, ordinary people would have taken place among the masses. Um, a connection can, can clearly be drawn between uh, clash struggle and, and football since its inception, be it the um, early sort of 15th century um, conflicts around private ownership of land up until the um, fans opposing the football authorities' fairly recent um, plans to create a super league made up of the, the uh, so-called elite clubs of, um, of Europe. So in that last example, I think the, the general gist of what I'm, I'm trying to say is um, what we saw there was mostly working class, ordinary people demonstrating against the, the plans of the authorities and people in power who were looking to take something away from them. Um, in order to increase their already obscene wealth. And, and I, my proposition basically is what is that if it's not class struggle? Um, 
and in the extreme examples of, of the, the period of hooliganism in the 80s, 70s and 80s in Britain, that saw a, a expression of that of that class culture, um, had, had their own symbols and rituals and fashions, um, a way of life and identity. I contend that, uh, you know, they, those were a counter movement to the deindustrialization, the unemployment, attacks on working class institutions that were carried out um, by Thatcher and, and alike, um, which left working class communities um, with little else other than their, their club through which to express their identity um, and their anger and frustration. And some of those symbols are still prominent today. Um, the use of the Union Jack, for example, um, which had later connotations with the far right. And as a result, some, some left thinking football fans see that aspect um, of fan culture as nationalist and negative. I think that's what uh, Chair was uh, alluding to in her introduction. And if there was more time, we'd probably be able to expand on that conversation on whether a sort of feeling of revolutionary defeatism might kick in amongst left-wing fans where they where they want their country, if you like, to, to, to maybe lose, but we don't have time for that. So um, I think if we fast forward from them primitive, uh, primitive days to um, a developed capitalism and a developed industry of football, we've seen right-wing political organisations um, who have been able to exploit the mass participation in football and they've been able to uh, disseminate their ideas into into large groups the group called the football lads alliance which later become ironically the democratic football uh, lads alliance were able to embed themselves within fan bases by embracing that football culture they're then able to incorporate the ideology and prejudices directly into the movement and they often preyed on real societal issues um, and political issues and then take them onto the terraces. Um, these groups invariably are linked to political organisations such as UKIP, um, the English Defence League. In the 70s and 80s, it was National Front and um, the BMP. And they found fertile ground for recruitment. Um, that's where we see the, the hangover of the symbols that used to be um, what express national pride have now become linked with with those far right movements. But it's not a new tactic. Um, it's something that they've learned from from past examples of, of far right, fascist, racist regimes and, and people in power um, using football in order to um, Exp uh, expand their ideas. Most obvious will probably be the Roman hierarchy using um, gladiatorial fights and, and, and animal hunts to ingratiate themselves with the masses. But when looking at football specifically, um, the best example would probably be Mussolini in Italy. Um, as a former journalist, he understood the important nature of, of of shaping class consciousness and he did this with football in the uh, 1920s and 30s in order to reshape public consciousness and um, make it look on fascism his fascist regime favorably through propaganda he was able to to ferment nationalist sentiment um, by associating it with the sporting success of the team um, italy won the 1934 and 1938 World Cups and so, uh, the football in the 36 Olympics. Um, people older than me may be able to to say that um, this was on merit of, of pure sporting ability. Um, but Mussolini took those chances with that anyway. Um, it's widely claimed that he influenced the uh, sporting bodies, um, the organising institutions and the referees to guarantee that he got that success. And given fascism's um, tendency towards undemocratic um, control of administrative bodies, it's, it's hard to argue that that didn't take place. Um, in the 1938 final, it's believed that he gave a talk to the players and demanded that the team win or die. Um, and when Italy did win, the opponent goalkeeper, uh, a Hungarian is reported to have said, I may have let in four goals, but at least I saved their lives. Um, 
and what he was able to do so successfully was to to, to take what he was achieving in in football back into wider society. Um, the team wore a black kit to resemble the colours of fascism. They displayed Roman salutes before games, and these images were were shared widely across all the propaganda um, around the country. And to give an idea of how easy that 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 could be to do, um, if you think back to the lead up to last Sunday's final, all TV, news, uh, radio, newspapers, all geared towards you know this 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 frenzy of of um, national pride. Um, whether you engage with football or not, um, you know you. you, you it was coming into your homes via the radio, via TV, via, via your newspaper. Um, so whether, even whether you, you weren't in, uh, involved in football, it was hard not to be taken in um, with this. And you can see how easy that could have, with a slightest little push, been pushed towards um, more nationalism rather than, than national pride. Um, Hitler also used this tactic. Um, most prominently in the in the 36 Berlin Olympics to promote his um, fascist regime on the on the world stage. Um, sporting success was portrayed as resulting from discipline and uh, power. And that's easy to, to then filter that through to other aspects of life um, and create justification for the, the acceptance of fascist ideas. Um, here in Britain, the idea of discipline and, and power shows why some of the elite public schools um, favoured playing football um, for their students before it split into the two codes of, of um, rugby and football. Um, some would argue it split because a public school board cheated and picked up the ball and ran with it, but uh, I'm sure the rugby fans amongst you will tell me that that's a, just a historical myth. Um, Franco did likewise in Spain. Um, he cultivated and increased divisions that already existed um, in the lead up to the civil war there. He, he took the tactic of favouring certain teams and demonising others um, in order to put forward his ideas in a positive light. He picked Real Madrid. Um, I don't think he was even a fan of football, but he, he understood um, that this was a route to large numbers of people um, that watch the game. Um, there's other examples that I'm sure um, listeners will be able to point to and and um, and see for themselves. In today's political leadership, you, you've got uh, Bolsonaro in Brazil, Erdogan in Turkey. All of these look for endorsement from leading players. We've seen photos of them. Um, them in their election campaigns with with uh, the best players from their from their countries they're just as important as some of the business leaders that they have their pictures taken with and if you're on social media you'll see that every time that England score um, it is quickly accompanied by politicians in in ill-fitting football tops showing just just how with the masses they really are you know cheering and, and celebrating the goals um, Starmer often referred to in the papers of, of um, him playing football and um, supporting Arsenal and, and England. And as an example of how it flows the other way, um, current England manager or, or ex England manager now, Gareth Southgate, got embroiled in political matters. Uh, the one that springs to mind will be the, the players taking the knee um, to show their. Uh, support against racism um this was seized upon by the right wing as, as being woke and um it gained an echo within the fans uh within the fan base because they populated that area up to now um so were able to 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 put across their feelings on on that um in their way now there's some on the left that think pastimes like football um are designed to or or at least allowed by the ruling class um, sort of bread and circuses trick of letting us uh, engage in these uh, you know to to repress uh, oppress um, any sort of demonstrating or, or protest um, and that way you know it, it becomes a distraction 
um, we shouldn't have anything to do with it. We should be concentrating fully on the on the uh, route towards revolution. But you know whether that's true or not, I think's a little bit irrelevant, um, really, because um, the fact is football's watched by millions and attended by millions um, across the world. It creates a passion and devotion that, that is equal to religion uh, in a lot of places. Um, it's passed down through generations um, and goes right to the heart of um, communities around the world. Um, so when I see fans campaigning against ticket prices, um, I, I see ordinary people demanding higher wages and um, demanding an end to the profiteering of big business when they're protesting against takeovers of their club. Um, what's that? If not fighting for more democratic control uh, when they take over the clubs themselves? Is that not just a community form of working class control and, and organisation? Supporters clubs, they're trade unions, aren't they? A month for the fans. Um, when fans are complaining about the, the thousands that died, um, the thousands of migrant labour workers that died building um, sports stadiums for um, a country that has a litany of, of human rights abuses. I see that as a fight for workers' rights and international solidarity. So there are, if, if, if you think about it, very few concerns that are faced by football fans, either directly or, or indirectly, um, which couldn't be addressed by the, the minimum demands of a socialist or, or communist organisation. So there are fan groups such as those of Rai Vallecano in Spain, St Pauli in Germany, Celtic um, in Scotland, who have a fan base with left wing or, or progressive ideologies. They're not perfect. Um, and some of them have actually formal constitutions for uh, the fans uh, with left wing or, or socialist ideas incorporated into them. And they're dominant within their clubs. Um, some have to fight fascist organisations in the streets or, or on the terraces and have managed to combine uh, their communities with the football club on that basis. There's organisations such as the Football Lads and Lasses, Lasses Against Fascism, the Trade Union Football and Alcohol Committee who have worked hard to, to counter the right's dominance uh, within football culture and politicised fan bases. So there is potential. Um, to organise within football fans, within football culture. Uh, we've seen how easy it spills out into uh, wider society. So we wouldn't be closing ourselves off in any way to, to a number of people, even though that is, you know, we are talking about millions around the world. So I, I'll end by saying, I know sometimes it can be hard for people when they're seeing uh, drunken louts throwing plastic chairs around some town centre somewhere uh, during a major tournament but um, you might not see the, the the sort of revolutionary potential that that has but uh, the right wing have you know they, they've seen um, how that can be used and harnessed um, for their purposes so I think the least that we can do on the left is is give that a go um, so I think I'll, I'll leave it there um, I hope it can generate a bit of discussion um, around the ideas of whether football is an arena for politics and how the left organise within that. Thank you. Thank you very much, Carl. <clears throat> yes, it is. And I want to apologise for my slightly philistine <laughs> introduction. It's just the, the nationalism of, you know, international sports event, I think, is a bit is a bit uh, much sometimes. But yes, I, I totally agree. I think like like all questions that are important to the working class, we have to take it seriously. Like we have to take religion seriously as Marxists. We have to have answers uh, uh, for it, etc. And you said it is a bit like religion, but... I, I do actually think there is, um, you know, whereas religion will probably in a future socialist society will wither away, really, if you, you know, if we know everything, we know the, the, that's the moon, that's the stars, you know, there's there's no God, et cetera, that probably will wither away. I don't think the same can be said for, for sports. We just maybe democratize it uh, a bit more. And I just want to know your, your thoughts on that. For example, on, I mean, you mentioned really the, the lefty, Groups and there's a really good book. I think it's the wrong way around now, but it's called The Roaring Red Front. 
um, there's a really good book about sort of most left-wing um, clubs uh, around the world. I can really recommend it. It's really highly interesting. Um, but sort of in a sort of near future, I mean, uh, you know, in the past, we had things like the Workers' Olympics, and we had an opening by by Ben Lewis on this a few a few months ago, where, you know, there's still countries being represented, but it's done in a much more um, sort of fraternal way, and you don't have the the flag shagging and, and stuff, you know, and you, you have it in a more fraternal way and the audience got involved, et cetera. How do you see it in a in a sort of near to far future? How, how would sport be conducted in a more sort of, you know, socialistic way, perhaps? Yeah, that, uh, again, you know, I think if we were to look at football as we would anything else um, as communists, um, you know, uh, anybody that, studies communism knows that for a period there will be a crossover from um, capitalist society so you know we, we would have to use some of the institutions and and things that already exist within capitalism so the, the same could be with the football clubs um, you know if we go in from the fan base from the bottom up and reorganize them you know yeah if it comes to restructuring leagues um, I don't think at the present time we'd be able to set up a um an alternative league while the current leagues as etc exist i think that'd be like looking at the unions um people have tried to set up um unions against the ones that already exist and, and that's fallen on its arse in most cases so um using what's there at the minute yes have them goals in the long term to, to completely democratize the game bring it back to its working class roots but that's not to say that it becomes poorer. Um, I think a lot of the time when we're talking about uh, ideals as communists, you know, we, we put it across. Uh, with, there's been talks on this forum about primitive uh, primitive communism, and and we, we it seems like we're trying to drag people backwards in time. But in fact, um, you know, there's many things that were, that fans. I think there's a a large amount of people that would look towards uh, caps on wages for players, caps on uh, transfer markets. So. You know that would only make the game improve the game um, mm. with fan engagement. So I think using the institutions that are there currently, as well as working towards, like you say, you know, the, the examples of the Workers Olympics and so that could be used to further the game. Because as you say, it's not going away. Um, more and more people might be turning turning towards uh, grassroots football um, as their little own protest. I mean, I do. I'll go and watch semi professional football now. Um, as my little protest against how big football's got, but you know these 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 clubs are held so closely and deeply to, with people that 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 isn't going to happen either. So the best way to do it is, like we say, with society um, from the bottom up, create a movement in order to take back what is ours. And I thought in a in a society where we don't have to you know, labor away eight, nine, 10 hours a day, far more people would 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 want to do it. And, you know, different sports as well, of course, not just football. And um, Peter's got a question. <clears throat> Hi, Carl. Thanks very much for that. Um, it's interesting because I've looked at this before myself and, you know, what you mentioned very clearly is how football is a, a reflection of all the contradictions of why the society, you know, the, the nationalism and, um, and you mentioned class struggle. Um, so obviously uh, racism as well, which you, you, you touched on. And it kind of reflects different transitions in society, as you mentioned, the early folk football as well, which has had no rules. But then there was, you know, the, those particular societies were kind of, you know, didn't have a fetish on rules about the boundaries of where the game should be played across villages and all the rest of it. And so it's a different beast today, isn't it? Because it's capitalist society. So that gets me to my point that how are you defining class struggle? So, you know, because <clears throat> is it in Marxist terms? Um, Cause when I look at, you, know, you go to the match or you look at um, football supporters and they, they can be from different class. Most of them are working class, but they can be cross class, you know, so-called middle class and, and even, People of small businesses and that kind of thing can be, um, you know, really kind of like um, keen football fans, season ticket holders, attend them and see themselves as uh, traditional fans. So I was just wondering how you defined class and class struggle. And do you think it, there's any um, traction in seeing class struggle, just to add to that, as being premised, because it is capitalism, 
it is premised on you know the the uh, you know commodity form uh, of football. Yeah, you know, there's a struggle over the commodity form of football. Is is the any traction and and kind of cement the class struggle to that, so we can distinguish between classes. You know, um, you know by commodity form that that in many ways pe people see football as a kind of you know, community asset to use a capitalist way of looking at it, but basically the same. It's an object which has huge value and it has a social end, but at the same time, it exists as, exists as a business. So it's there to pursue profits, you know, value, if you like. And so the commodity form has that rupture, that conflict. And in many ways, like, because really do clubs make a profit, elite clubs and definitely clubs lower down don't, they rely on, you know, the kind of um, transfer of money down the system, if, if, if possible, from the EPLA to survive, EPL to survive, or they rely on fans bailing them out. So, but even at elite level, they really make a profit, and um, and the and even the owners say they're not owners really. You know, the kind of moral agents, the custodians, and the fans believe that they're the real owners. So it's a, it, it is a funny old business, and that reflects itself in it being a funny old commodity. You know, and maybe that's a the traction we need to develop a class analysis out of that. You know, so it just. To ask your opinion of that. Thanks, Peter. Um, that's all we've got time for in terms of questions on this issue. So do you want to reply to Peter? Thank you. Yeah, um, you know, e excellent points. And I, I urge people to go back and, and, and watch the um, session that, that Peter contributed to. He makes some excellent points, really starting at the basis of, of uh, as he's touched on there, how we view things. Um, so, you know, this this would come down to uh, opinion, how you interpret, as you said, what, what constitutes a class. Um, if we really wanted to have a macro look at it, you know, you could say, you know, you you, you were making examples of, of small shopkeepers and stuff that, that go and watch football and might stand next year. And, and when you're looking at a revolutionary movement, that middle strata has a choice to make, doesn't it? You know, does it fall in line behind the ruling class? Or does it uh, join with the the upsurge and, and revolutionary movement? Um, and through the ages, we've, we've we've seen different middle stratas have made different choices. But with, with with football, as you said, it's such a weird thing in that it is, if you like, viewed as a commodity, and people do view it as theirs and part of their communities. We, you know, some, we've seen heroic struggles from communities taking back their clubs dragging it back in to a capitalist model. Now, imagine if we were able to, to um, revolutionise fans to bring that back as being really theirs. Like you said, the, you know, these these so-called owners, yeah, they might be football fans, might be from the area, might have been watching the club forever, but it's, it's that model in which they want to run the club. Um, and they're going to help, you know, even if they've got the best interests at heart, even if they're socialists themselves, they're going to need that push. They're going to need that nudge, um, and and that starts with us, um, as you say, owning the clubs, maybe on a capitalist basis, um, but then transitioning that, like we will try and transition society um, in a revolutionary wave. Um, so I think I think the way I was looking at class struggle was, was basically, you know, from the feudal origins. Um, those that were trying to ban and those that were trying to stop and those that were trying to punish people would have been from from that strata of society. They would have been the ruling class. And uh, there's an argument about how much that's blurred over time. I would say not much. Um, they might look different, sound different, um, but there's still that ruling class that, 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 that pulled the strings and that's the same as in football. Thank you very much, Carl. Excellent presentation.